Hi, my name is Alexandra, and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome to A Lovely Jaunt, where we talk about literature. Today we're doing episode two of Ethan Frome by Edith Wharton. And let me tell you, that is a mouthful. I have had to take several takes to be able to spit that out properly. Um, and I just want to say that this book was actually requested by a Baron of B Books, Samantha, who has a booktube channel herself, which I will link in the description down below. And I'm so grateful because this book has been super interesting. In my previous episode, episode one, we took a look at Edith Wharton, um, a very brief summary of the work, and then focused heavily on the structure of the text, which is a framed narrative. Um, in that analysis, we took a look at some of the reasons why that structure was chosen, um, and basically I argued and came to the conclusion that it supported the story's main function, which is to investigate the deep inner self of Ethan Frome, this titular character. And the story is meant to be a revelation of the deepest parts of Ethan. It is an introspective novel and a character study. For today, I want to take a look at a couple of ideas borrowed from psychology uh, and tie them into the story as well. So let's take a look at Freud and Jung, these two grandfathers of the discipline. So I should say that I have no expertise in psychology or in the history of psychology. Uh, this is purely a layperson's understanding of these subjects. While the discipline certainly owes its origin to these two great thinkers, many of their original ideas and absolutely their methods have been set aside. Primarily, Freud was not particularly scientifically rigorous. Um, new clinical studies based on the scientific method with double-blind, triple-blind sort of structures to ensure that the those who are studying this thing do not bias the results um, are now putting into being put into place, um, which is not something that Freud did. Uh, but many of the ideas in Freud continue to influence uh, literary analysis. Why? Well, because they looked into stories and myths, and also dreams, um, for the inspiration of many of their central ideas. So for example, you've heard of the Oedipal Complex. Well, that is borrowed from the Greek play Oedipus Rex. The idea is, is borrowed from the scenario and situation that that main character was put it through. Uh, the influences are very strong and clear. So while psychological science has moved away from the various literary sources as primary evidence for inner workings of, of the human mind, and it certainly can be revelatory of what humans think about, but it's not important to understand that it's you know a highly consciously constructed work by a single person, um, and therefore it doesn't meet the science, the you know the rigor of scientific standards. But that doesn't mean that there's no reason why these ideas that they observed in literature do not continue to kind of hold true, because really what they were doing is literary analysis with a psychological topic. Um, and so I'm going to be touching on some of the ideas that they brought up and tie them into this story as well, from stories back to stories. All right, so let's dive into some weird Freudian and Jungian psychological analysis, which may be some of my favorite way to look at fiction. I mentioned an essay by Freud called The Unheimlich, or The Unheimlich, um, in English, The Uncanny, uh, in a previous episode, and I will link uh, it in the description box below so that you can read it. It's very interesting. Um, and again, for any sensitive readers, again, this is Freud, being Freud, so there is, you know, sexual analysis as well that's going into that, so make that determination for yourself if that's something that is appropriate for you to read. All right, so let's take a look at the uncanny um, as Freud presents it. So upon first blush, the uncanny can be described as sort of a creepy feeling or an uneasy feeling, but it's not simply just a feeling of fear. Uh, Dread might be a little bit closer, but the feeling is inspired by a particular type of context, um, one in which the familiar suddenly appears foreign, or, but perhaps vice versa, a foreign place somehow has this undercurrent of familiarity like you've been there before. Um, and it is in this incongruity of the combination of feeling both comfortable and extremely uncomfortable in a particular situation that basically brings forth the goosebumps, the dread, the creeps, and those feelings that come along with it. 
In his essay, Freud spends several pages uh, of etymological analysis in hundreds of languages showing that they have a pair of words to express this idea. Um, in German, the, bear, the pair of words are the unheimlich and the heimlich. In English, it is translated as the uncanny or, and the canny, and, and in this case, canny meaning pleasant or nice. Um, but the word has changed over time and it's not a very common word, so it might be easier or more accurate to say, you know, the homely, the familiar, the comfortable. Um, those are pro probably getting at that meaning a little bit better. Now, the interesting thing about these pairs of words is that while being polar opposites, um, they also bleed together and overlap. In German, the word Heimlich means familiar, the close, but it's also developed to mean things that are personal or private to you because those are the things that are most familiar and closest to you. So, for example, your home is somewhere where you feel comfortable that's familiar to you, but even more personal and private might be your bedroom, might be your bathroom. Um, it's even more private. You don't let strangers into your home, and even less so um, do you let strangers into your bedroom, right? Um, so uh, so the extremely familiar is also the extremely pri private. And so you can see how what is heimlich to you is unheimlich to somebody else, right? Um, and, but at the same time, everyone has a home, everyone has a room, has, has their own bedroom, everybody has their own bathroom. So in a sense, even your private spaces are very heimlich um, at the same time that they are unheimlich because they're not yours. And so this is where you can see the overlap of the words and the intersection of the concepts uh, and, and where that occurs. So that uncanny feeling happens in that sort of overlap of the Venn diagram of those two words and where that, that you know, concept over, overlaps. Um, and it's in that space where something is both familiar and unfamiliar at the same time. All right, so back to Ethan Fromm. Why am I bringing up the concept of the uncanny for this story? Well, the whole narrative surrounds this uncanny character. Ethan Frome is himself uncanny, especially to the narrator. Ethan, who is familiar to the narrator in some ways, a man who works hard, who takes care of his family, who has obligations, who obviously doesn't really want to be stuck in this Starkfield, Massachusetts, much, much like the narrator himself, um, is very, also very private and secluded and in fact there's a way in which the whole town almost colludes to keep the secret of Ethan from. Um, the narrator stays with a character na named Mrs. Hale who is you know the town gossip and so he goes to her and tries to get warm her up and get her to start talking about the story because he knows that something is there there's some sort of hidden thing that has happened that this town doesn't really want to talk about and she, even she clamps up so there's this sense that there's this whole town kind of holding this secret and it's surrounded and it has its heart in Ethan Frome himself. Ethan Frome is a fixture in the town, almost has this permanent quality to him. So Harmon, another town's member that the narrator talks to, describes Ethan as having been in Starkfield for too many winters and as someone who's trapped there who hasn't been able to get away. Um, and we see that Ethan has this routine. He comes to the post office at the same time, internally enduring these revolutions of these cold, harsh winters of Massachusetts. And even the character admits um, a, that he also feels the sense of being stuck there, even if just for one winter. So we have this parallel of emotion. Um, so this is a quote from in the novel, and he says, I chafed at first, when he found out that he was going to be stuck there for the winter, and then under the hypnotizing effect of routine, gradually began to find a grim satisfaction in the life. So again, we have this sense that this character is also getting stuck in this place, um, and sort of having this grim satisfaction, much like Ethan Frome does. The narrator is paralleling basically the feelings of Ethan. Uh, must uh, the narrator is watching Ethan experiencing what he himself is experiencing in, and is twinning him, is doubling him, and is experiencing the familiar basically externalized in this other character. Uh, and that's where the uncanny sensation comes from. So it would basically be like for this narrator, the relationship between himself and Ethan Throne would be the sensation of if you looked in the mirror and you're looking at your reflection, but then your reflection does some action that you don't do. And that would be then 
you know, something very, very familiar to you doing something completely foreign to you. And that's what's happening right here, is that Ethan Frome and the narrator mirror each other, but we need to see one of them make different choices than the other one. It's no surprise then that Ethan Frome's home, that center of the Heimlich, the very center of himself, the most private and familiar space is where this revelation happens. The narrator cannot gain the wisdom that he needs, the answer to his question, without ever going to that inner sanctum of his twin. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about the doppelganger. I've already talked about how these characters are twins of each other, and, and that's basically the uh, Jungian idea. And, it, uh, and that's what comes into play here is this twinning, and the twinning is what's under scoring this feeling of the of the uncanny. Um, so the doppelganger, this is the inner self that you must reconcile yourself with. It is your evil twin, it is your dark side. As I mentioned in the, uh, the narration draws these parallels between Ethan Frome and the narrator, setting them up as reflections of one another. And the doppelganger is that evil or dark reflection of the self. The purpose of the doppelganger is for the mature and self-actualized person to come into uh, contact and realization with this doppelganger, with this evil self, which is your own capacity to do evil, and understand that you have that capacity, but become more mature, self-controlled, and able to choose to do good despite it. Um, and this is, you know, as mentioned, this is essential to personal growth. Uh, one of the best and most iconic representation of this idea is actually brilliantly executed in Star Wars when Luke goes into the cave on Dagobah. I'm getting get nerdy right now. It's gonna be awesome. Um, and you know, it's like this center for dark force, and he battles with this incarnation, this spirit version of Vader, only to realize that it's really himself. Like the mask pops off, and you see Luke's face in there, and so he's battling with his inner self, his own capacity for evil. And Luke must reconcile that the power he has with the Force to be uh, can be used for the light side just as well as it can be used for the dark side. He must admit to himself that he could become the next Vader just as well as he could become the next champion. Um, and to reject his capacity for evil, which is what Anakin does, uh, would be to inevitably call it forth into reality, which is what happens to Anakin. Um, only after Luke has faced this test can he successfully face Vader, and with this wisdom he's able to redeem his own father. So this journey of the nameless first person narrator, uh, it, that's what he has to do. Only by facing Ethan, his, his fate, his dark twin, uh, he has to of what Ethan has done in the inner sanctum of his home. Only, only after doing that can he emerge with the wisdom and maturity to not make the same mistakes that Ethan has made. Um, which in this case would be to be stuck at Starkfield, not moving forward, not growing, not becoming better, wiser, and stronger. Now, it's no, uh, it's no accident that the, this first-person narrator is both first-person and nameless. One, as a first-person narration, we're put into the position of the narrator. It, it, we go along in that journey with the narrator. Um, and so the reader must view the entire story through the narrator's eyes. Um, and we must go into this journey into the dark inner sanctum, right? We have to go into the home of Ethan. Ethan blah blah blah. We have to go into the home of Ethan. Um, and we must, like the narrator, emerge more wise and more capable to face the world and ourselves. Um, and the narrator remains nameless because that journey is the journey of all of us. All right, so that's going to wrap it up for this episode. We have covered the topic of the uncanny and how it relates to Ethan, as well as the topic of the doppelganger and how the narrator and Ethan are twinning each other and how that journey for the narrator is our own. Come back for episode three. We'll be talking about the power of the spoken word um, in the next episode. And until next time, I'm Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile.